Thank you again for joining us today at the Black and Design Conference, Designing Resistance, Building Coalitions. We've heard today from a fantastic array of speakers, and we are very grateful for their participation, candor, and enthusiasm as we highlight the African diaspora in design. To our performers, thank you for sharing your inspiring artistry, which refreshed our bodies and minds during the course of the day. And to you, the audience, thank you for your insightful questions, personal reflections, and affirmation of the importance of the Black and Design mission. We hope that you have enjoyed the program. With the theme this year of designing resistance, building coalitions, we are grateful for the various perspectives and reflections that have emerged from this starting point. We started the conversation last evening with Hamza Walker and revisited the role of identity today with Seku, Brandon, and Courtney connecting across the themes of culture and the mind. Michelle and Walter continue the conversation by reflecting on the role of history and memory in design and curation. We enjoy the discussion of Sharon, Diane, and Antoinette on community engagement and addressing representation in the design process from Columbia University to New Orleans to St. Louis. And finally, we were inspired by the radical futures discussed by Mabel, Mario, Ingrid, and Wyking that we are all looking to create as designers. The twofold mission of the Black and Design Conference is to highlight designers of the African diaspora and unearth the agency and unique skills that designers hold to envision more radical and equitable futures, both within and beyond the traditional de definitions of design. In this vein, we are looking to unlock the power of a network of black and brown visionaries who identify with all aspects of design from artists to policymakers. Our closing keynote speaker is a visionary voice and leader for social action who will reflect on his experiences that can inspire and inform us as designers. He will then be joined by a moderated conversation with Barika Williams, Deputy Director of the Association for, Housing, for Neighborhood Housing and Development in New York. We are honored to have here today DeRay McKesson, a civil rights activist focused primarily on issues of innovation, equity, and justice. Born and raised in Baltimore, Maryland, he has advocated for issues related to children, youth, and families since he was a teen. As a leading voice in the Black Lives Matter movement and the co-founder of Campaign Zero and OurStates.org, he has worked to connect individuals with knowledge and tools and provide citizens and policymakers with common sense policies to ensure equity. Spurred by the death of Mike Brown and the subsequent protest in Ferguson, Missouri, he has become a key voice in the effort to confront the systems and structures that have led to the mass incarceration and police killings of black and other minority populations. He is also the host of Pod Save the People, a weekly podcast focused on activism and social justice. Please join me in welcoming Duray McKesson. It is an honor to be here. I'm excited uh, to have this conversation with you all. I don't normally do presentations, so if I screw up the clicker, I apologize in advance. And uh, I'm excited for the questions that might come afterwards. So I've titled this On the Other Side of Freedom, but I'll start on this side of freedom. Is that I never forget the protests in August of 2014 when Mike Brown was killed. One of the things that I remember the most about that time is that it was illegal to stand still in August, September, and October of 2014. People forget that if we stood still for more than five seconds, we were immediately arrested. And I remember that time because that is when I became an activist in this way in so many ways. I taught, I taught sixth grade math. It was incredible. Sixth grade is the best grade if any of you are ever gonna be K-12 teachers. <laughs> Seventh grade is tough, uh, but sixth grade is, sixth grade is beautiful. And I think about, I think about the protest as like a grounding experience for me. So I'll talk about on the other side of freedom, but I'll start on this one. And on this side of freedom, there are two states still that have what we call non-unanimous juries. So in Louisiana and Oregon, it only takes 10 people out of 12 on a jury to convict you of a felony. So life without the possibility of parole. And that's directly linked to integration, that when black people started to sit on juries, they wanted to make sure that the conviction rate wouldn't go down. Um, when I think about things like the three largest mental health institutions in the country are all jails. So Cook County a Jail in Chicago is the largest jail in the country. It used to have 18,000 people and now has about 10,000. It's the largest mental health facility in the country. We think about places like Angola. I did a six-hour tour of Angola 
It is 28 square miles, 18,000 acres. It used to be four plantations that is now one. And we think about a third of all Americans killed by a stranger actually killed by police officers. So I start there because we know this side of freedom all too well. And I want to figure out how we get to the other side of freedom. Now, I think about freedom as not only the absence of oppression, but the presence of justice and joy. So much of the work that we do focuses on the absence of oppression. When we think about all of the, the rhetoric around Trump is trying to mitigate all the bad stuff. And Lord knows there's enough bad stuff that we need to stop. But the presence of justice and joy is the part that we don't talk about enough in this work. That when we think about Trump, when he says, make America great again, that that is... That ask is about memory and recall, that we've actually lived in a world where white people have terrorized everybody. We've lived in a world where white people have controlled everything. So he's asking us to remember that and to bring that back. That to bring in a world of justice and joy and equity, we've never seen that world before. So that requires deep imagination, that we'll have to dream that up. And that if we can't imagine it, we can't fight for it. I also will just ground and start about the, the difference between equality and equity. That equality is this idea that everybody gets the same thing. Equity is the idea that people get what they need and deserve. And the work around justice is almost always about equity. So when we think about education, it's, I'm a third generation reader, that I'm in the third generation of people in my family who can read and comprehend text. My great grandmother could sign her name and she was incredibly proud of it. But when we think about closing the reading gap, that that's about equity. That what does it mean to teach a class of people who weren't allowed to read? that that is just not the same as people who've been reading for 10 generations, that that work is equity work. So the first part will be, why aren't we there yet? I'll start with this notion of I never take for granted that people don't know. I remember when the protests first started, and we would talk to people who we were trying to get them to organize in their own communities, and they would say, DeRay, the problem's only in Ferguson. And one of the biggest differences from now, from today to back then, is that people really thought Ferguson had a problem. They didn't think America had a problem. And now, you know, that has changed. But it was, the death of, uh, it was the death of Sandra Bland and Freddie Gray and Walter Scott that helped people see that this was actually much closer to them than they thought. Now, I'll go over some things that we don't talk about enough in public. But the reality is that black people are actually more likely to be unarmed than other people who are killed by the police. There are 13 places in the country, 13 of the 100 largest cities, black men are more likely to be killed by a police officer than the average person is by a private citizen. That people colloquially talk about this notion that in high crime areas there's likely to be police violence, right? That like if there's a lot of crime, the police are just gonna be really active and therefore there will lead to violence by the police and that actually isn't true. The data doesn't bear that out. So you'll see there's actually no correlation between violent crime and police, uh, police violence. And this we know all too painfully real. That of the police that kill people, almost none are charged and very few are convicted. I start here because when I think about why we aren't yet free, what does that look like? What is holding us back? One of it is I think that on the, I'll say on the left, but people who believe in equity and justice, we take for granted that people just understand the facts. And I'm mindful every single day they don't. I remember when I was talking to people in, in September of 2014, like the police are killing people. They were like, Dre, you're being dramatic. And I'm like, no, the police are killing, they really are killing people. Uh, and it was one of those things that blew my mind. And people would say to me, Dre, why are you trying to convince white people? And I'm like, who said anything about white people? I'm talking about black people didn't believe us, right? So how do we start to develop these narratives that people can repeat at their dinner tables? How do we help people like, understand what is true and what is not true? How do we become the people who are processing the data on our own in ways that help people think about the world differently? This is data that we did with Mapping Police Violence probably two and a half years ago. And we did it so that we could help people just think about this differently. Now, this next thing I'll call the ideology of ideology. I didn't put, because I don't want to start a problem in the academic community, I'm going to put two quotes up. And I will not, uh, I did not attribute them to anybody, but you know, you can Google and see who they are. <laughs> I'll start here with this one because I'm fascinated by the people who really their ideology is one of ideology. Like it's not an ideology of justice, it's not an ideology of black people, it's not about equity. It's sort of like people who hold beliefs to, beliefs to have beliefs. And I thought about this because of the election, that there were some people who were more invested in sort of this ideological purity than they were real people's lives, and I'm fascinated by that. 
I think about it too with healthcare, that there were so many people during the first round of the repeal who were like, they were against Obamacare because they were against markets, right? And like, what does it mean when people get really invested in the ideology for the, for the pure sake of having one? I'll start with this quote. Have you read it? It is by someone that we all love and respect. What this person does sort of later is that they go into this idea of um, the lesser of two evils. And there was this whole essay about how she was so bad that we just shouldn't participate in talking about her in any good way. And this was another quote by somebody that we all know and respect. And I'm fascinated by these because in hindsight, people now would look at this and they're like, we can't actually afford to lose them. That that is so wild. <laughs> But when this person said it, people cheered, right? Like people were in love with, I remember when this person said it on TV and on Twitter, and people were like, you know what, this is like, this is, this is right, that this is ideologically pure. And there is something about the ideology of ideology that I think does real damage. That what does it mean when we get disconnected from the impact that these things will have on people's lives? That now when you talk about Trump, people are like, it's so crazy, it's so wild. But there were people saying that in, you know, in August. There were people saying it way before the election. And how do we grow from a place where we talk about the lesser two evils as if this is a zero sum game? And I'll talk about Hillary later and I'm meeting with her, but I wanted to just point this out as an explicit thing. I think that there are some people who are in love with the theory of the way the world works, divorced from the way that it actually impacts people. And I think that Trump is really interesting in that regard because there were people before the election who said things like, you know, I'm not running, I'm not gonna vote for president because the president doesn't impact my life. I'm gonna vote for sort of all the local people. And there were people who cheered them on that, that that was like an ideological stance, definitely in movement politics, that it was like okay to hate the entire system. And now it's those same people who are being destroyed even further by the system who have to resist in a whole different way. I get frustrated when people are like, Deray, well, you know, it's really beautiful that people are on the street and da da da. And it's like, how do we find a way to talk about the importance of resistance without glorifying the trauma that actually makes people resist? And I think that people do that inadvertently, that they're like so proud of the fact that people are resisting, that they essentially are like, thank God there's trauma because we can see all this amazing organizing. And I'm always mindful, <laughs> I'm always mindful of all the stuff that I could be doing that wasn't trying to fight white people, right? Like all the stuff that I could be doing that wasn't trying to make sure that black kids could read or that they would just be alive, that I'm more excited about that world, that we fight because we have to, not because we want to, not because there's glory in it, not because the trauma has blessed us with the resistance, which is how some people talk. And I don't want us to glorify that, but I think about these things and I wanna call them out explicitly so that you can think about, are there any moments where you've been more in love with an ideology or a theory than real people's lives? And I think that that happens more often than we say. Now, the next two I'll talk about briefly. One is the pessimism of, uh, the pessimism of Peter Pan, as I call it. Uh, how many of you watched Hook? Do you remember the movie Hook? No. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Do you remember in Hook when, um, when Peter couldn't fly anymore because he didn't believe? I think that there's something that happens in movement spaces when people stop believing that we can win with the capital W, so they try to win with the lowercase w for themselves. And there's something about that that I, I'm starting to see do real damage. But the other thing that the pessimism does to people is that they contaminate all solutions. So there are people who are like, I'm anti-capitalist. And then you're like, well, what should I replace it with? And they're like, you're the problem. And you're like, that is wild, right? Like, I'm, <laughs> I'm just trying to understand. Or you're like, you know, I think that we can talk about charter schools in a nuanced way. And they're like, well, charter schools are damaging kids. And you're like, okay. Right? So how do, we, how do we name the fact that there's some people that the way that their pessimism actually manifests is that any solution that you propose is automatically contaminated. It automatically has this kernel of something that can't be right that is automatically corrupted. And I think that again, that goes back to this ideological purity. But the reality is like we live in an impure world and we all, as much as any of us might be anti-capitalist, we buy things, we have favorite brands, that this is always a complicated space to be in. But there is something that I see about this pessimism, and there is a, a writer that we all know and love who has a new book out that many of us will read, uh, who I think is particularly attuned to naming and glorifying this pessimism. And there's real damage that I think that that does to the way that we think about what it means to win and what freedom looks like. 
that we have to have hope, not only because hope is an important ingredient, but if we think about the past, those people fought under circumstances that were way wilder than ours, and they still believe that we could get to tomorrow. There's a difference between hope as magic and hope as work. And there's some people who condemn hope as magic, and that makes sense to me. But I understand hope to be work. When I think about hope, it's a belief that our tomorrows can be better than our today's, and I know that it doesn't just magically happen, right? It only gets there because we work hard and people work hard in that way. And I want to name the pessimism so that we can call it out in the future. And the last thing in this chunk about why we aren't there yet, I'll talk back about my sixth graders who were great. Seventh grade is puberty and deodorant, and it's like just a nightmare. But sixth grade was like amazing. And I taught 90 minute classes. So imagine being with 11 year olds for 90 minutes. It's a long time to be with 11 year olds. And I only talked for like 20 minutes. So it was like 70 minutes of like practice, which is a long time. And this one class, my first year, I had them for 120 minutes, which is an even longer time to have sixth grade math. In this one class, they came up and they were like, DeRay and Mr. McKesson, can we, um, DeRay. <laughs> oh, they were like, um, Mr. McKesson, it's funny, you know, I taught a decade ago, which is so wild. So one of my students uh, just sent me an Instagram video, yes, he's 19, which is also wild, um, of him singing this song that we used to sing in class together. And I was like, I'm old. I'm not that old. Um, but we had a 120-minute class, and uh, one, a set of students were like, can we go to gym? And my best friend in the world was the gym teacher. So I'm like, yeah, you can go with Mr. O. He'll have you. You can go early. And all of a sudden, they come back really quickly. And I'm like, why are y'all back? You know, I thought y'all wanted to go to gym. And it was in that moment that I realized that they were in love with the idea of gym more than the work of gym. <laughs> And I think about that now in the resistance space. So there are people who are so in love with the idea of resistance and not the work of resistance. So you talk to them and they give you that speech that is down. They're like, ACA, we need it, DACA, da da da. And you're like, what are you doing? And they're like, ACA is, and you're like, okay. <laughs> and that is not to say that talking about it isn't the work. I fundamentally believe that we are born woke, but something wakes us up. And for so many people, it was a conversation or a tweet or a Facebook post. But there are some people who are in love with the idea of resistance. I think about, I went, I went to some city not too long ago, and somebody DM'd me, and she was like, I have all my protest posters in the closet. I'm ready whenever you are. And you're like, what is going on, right? Like, this is not, this isn't like a, an exciting sort of adventure that we're on, that we're doing this because we have to in so many ways. Now the thoughts about how do we get there. This, I'm fascinated with this idea of organizing beyond organizations, and it, I only believe it because of Ferguson, that what was magical about being in St. Louis, and we were in the street for 400 days in that first chunk, the protesters are again in the street in St. Louis on day 23 today. What was beautiful about it is that there was no organization that like started us being in the streets. There was no like organizing community that like we sat down every day and decided who did what. It was a difference between infrastructure and organization. So there were people like me who were the tweeters, there were people who were the live streamers, there were people who were the bail fund. And we all knew each other and we knew how to communicate with each other, we talked when we needed to, but there wasn't this like one sort of place that directed everything and we were able to stay in the street for 400 days, which is pretty incredible. And I think that there are some organizations that this sort of desire to form organizations in some ways reinforces the same things that people want to undo. So I think about education, that there are a lot of people now who are in love with technology and education. They're like, you know, we're going to put smart boards and we're going to have whiteboards and we're going to have technology driven from the ceiling. And the reality is in so many classrooms, they're really just using technology to reinforce the traditional ways of teaching. They're not actually doing anything radical. So it's just not a chalkboard anymore, it's a smart board. And it's like the same sort of learn and get that you were doing for the past 30 years. And I say that as somebody who has taught, and I was most recently the chief of human capital in the school system in Baltimore. We had 11,000 employees, 180 schools, and 80,000 80, students. And you go to classrooms and you're like, y'all have every gadget that could happen and nobody's learning, right? They're like, you have a clicker and like they have quiz buttons and like the smart board moves and dings and they can draw on it and still nobody's learned, right? And I think that that is also happening in organizations, that people are like building these organizations because people have told people that that's the only way that you can build power. And actually, they're just reinforcing the same hierarchy, the same patriarchy, the same sort of idea of if I know you, then you can do work. But if you're not a part of my team, you can't do work. And I want us to think about, is there a way to build power that's not just in organizations? Is there a way to build infrastructure that's really strong and can move people and move 
issues that doesn't necessarily require a 501c3. And what all of you also would likely know is that who gets into the room with the 501c3 conversation is automatically a smaller set of people. So there are people in every community doing incredible work who just don't know how to play the game well, which doesn't mean that they're not amazing organizers, which doesn't mean that they're not amazing activists. And one of the things that I worry about when we talk about organizations is the only way to build power is that we really are creating this funnel that is reinforcing like a narrow set of people who can lead. And there are two ways that I think that organizers organize. One is, and there's a big organization that I will not name, but there's one that says, please, um, the organization will say, please invest in me. So please give me your email address and donate to me and I'll fight on your behalf. And there are a lot of organizations that essentially do that. There's another way of organizing that says, let me help build your capacity and we should all fight together. I would say that the majority of organizations are actually the former and not the latter, even if they posture to be the latter. There's this other thing that happens when we think about organizations, and not just organizations, but also the organizing community, is this question of what is authenticity? Who is the, the authentic protester? Who is the authentic organizer? Who is the authentic activist? And for so many people, people's proximity to trauma is actually the marker of authenticity. So like the more gang members you know, if you've been abused as a kid, like you are actually the best organizer. And that's how people think about this work. And the reality is that you actually shouldn't have to have deep proximity to trauma to do good work. I know a lot of people who are just traumatized, that they like have proximity to trauma, they didn't learn skills from it, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. You don't have to learn how to be a great organizer from everything that happens to you in the world. But how do we start to talk about authenticity as people's proximity to work and that doesn't mean that we lose our focus on the most marginalized. It doesn't mean that we lose our focus on proximity in general. But both my parents were drug addicts. Uh, my father raised us. My mother left when I was three. She just came back when I was 30. And I say that because I know what it's like to grow up in a community of recovery. I know more about addiction than I'd like to know. But that doesn't necessarily make me a better organizer around addiction. It makes me somebody who has closer proximity to trauma. So how do we start talking about the organizing work a little better with a little more nuance? And I think about this too in this idea of the things that have become weapons that weren't intended to be. And our trauma wasn't intended to be a weapon to fight other people in this work. And I think it has become for some people. I love this Ella Baker quote because I think it speaks to the way I think about this work. That my allegiance is to a cause, it's not to an organization. Now, social media, social media, I talk about Twitter all the time, as you can imagine, but I think about Twitter as the friend that's always awake, that one of the reasons that I tweeted so much and I still tweet so much is that it's like, there's somebody always there, which is great. I think about social media, too, as something that allows us to fight back against erasure. And erasure often manifests in two ways. One is that either the story is never told or is told by everybody but us, and in this moment, we became the unerased, which is really powerful. I think about in those early days, like protesters, organizers would, they would create, um, they would create like an action somewhere and they'd call me and be like, DeRay, we're gonna do this thing. And I would call a reporter and be like, meet us at the corner of so-and-so 15 minutes before the action is gonna be. I can't tell you at all what's gonna happen because I've not been allowed to tell people, but like be there. And I remember also being able to stand on the corner and we could tweet, be at a corner and we could get 3,000, 4,000 people to come out. And before Twitter or before social media, there was no way to organize like that. I can talk to a million people at the drop of a hat when I want to, which is pretty powerful. Now, I don't often, um, because I don't often do presentations, I don't talk about these things. So I'll do them for you because you know I'm doing a presentation today. Is that this picture, I'll never forget it. It was one of the most important things um, to me in the very beginning, helping me understand the sense of community. I cut the date off, but I took it on August 19th. So, if any of you came to St. Louis, we were marching up and down West Florissant because we had to, not because we thought marching was like this really incredible tactic from the civil rights movement. We just couldn't stand still. So we were going back and forth. And one day, I'll never forget, I look over and they're like grilling on the sidewalk. So like if you needed a hamburger or a hot dog, there were just people out there who had you. In those early days, if you talked to any of the protesters, there was just so much water. People who weren't there would just order pizzas to the sidewalk. So like literally 50 pizzas. You're like, where'd the pizza come from? And there would just be a ton of pizza outside. And it was just this incredible sense of community. But I think that so often, these images of the beauty of community that came in protest weren't what you saw anywhere else but social media. I think about social media's ability to also accelerate the pace of information. So this was a DM that I got a couple days ago. And I've thought about it a lot because I take for granted sometimes what it means to put things on the timeline that I think that you know people aren't really listening to what I say anymore, but what I retweet matters more. 
and this struck me a lot because it's, uh, not only is this sort of an interesting way that social media allowed her to move in the space, but you think about the rapidity with, with which information can travel now. And that's just so different. So when I think about how social media might change the way we can organize and what it means for getting us to freedom is that we will be able to spread information quicker and hopefully that will help people see the work to be done. And this last one is, uh, you know, I put this up here because the foreign policy uh, newspaper just did a, a study on the FBI. So the FBI visited my house and I wasn't home and this is where he left me. <laughs> and, um, it was a business card in the mailbox so you can see the fold at the, um, where he's stuck it in the mailbox. And it was, Duray, please call me at my office. So needless to say, I did not call this FBI agent back. And uh, my lawyer hadn't handled this conversation. But I say this because one of the other things is when we talk about freedom of speech doesn't mean freedom from, con from consequences, is that we understand that too in the social justice space. That sometimes having a voice and speaking will lead to things like this. And I wasn't the only person they visited. They visited a couple people. But I've never shown this picture before today. I forgot that I had it actually until I was going through stuff. And I was like, I did take a picture of this ridiculous message. Um, from him. You know, in our last meeting with President Obama, um, I didn't talk to President Obama about this, but I was sitting two seats down from Loretta Lynch, and I looked over and I was like, um, Attorney General Lynch, the FBI visited my house, and that's just unnecessary. And she literally just, <laughs> and she, um, I'll never forget it because she literally just smiles and just like looks through me and keeps walking. I was like, <laughs> Now this question of inside out, outside in, is that we met with uh, Hillary and we met with Bernie, and there are a lot of people, and again, I think this goes back to the pessimism, that they are like, any time you sit at the table, it is automatically contaminated. There's nothing good that can come out of it. Now I'll start with Bernie. Bernie is exactly what you think he's gonna be. He's like, ah, like he is like that. He's like an old man, he talks like that. You're like, okay, Bernie. And one of the hard things about Bernie is that Bernie's Bernie's mind is acutely attuned to economics and just he just didn't get raced in. So he said, he said, you know, I believe in a jobs bill that'll bring 70 million jobs to the country. You're like, okay, cool. And we said, well, how do you know those jobs will actually go to poor people, people of color? And he said, well, there are more of them. And you're like, Bernie, that's not how the game is played, right? That's just not, that's not it. And what we did do with his team, like Marcus is over there, Simone, must, she must have been taking the picture, but Simone, who most of you know on CNN now, is that we spent a lot of time after this meeting pushing his team on the platform from behind the scenes, sort of helping them think about, like, what are the things you should be talking about? How do you scale this? What would you do if you, if you were in power? And that was the work that people can't always see, but we thought that that was really important, that we know that having a seat at the table doesn't mean that we ever leave the streets. And we also know that having a seat at the table means that we always keep the door open, that we are only at the table to make sure the truth is present, and that we never think that we are the only people who can bring the truth in any room. Now this meeting with Hillary was a little challenging. The second meeting with her was much better. This one was a little rough because Hillary, you know, I organized this meeting and right before her staffer said, Duray, Hillary's coming to listen. And I said, well, this is going to be awkward because we came to listen. And it was like this moment of like, we're like, this is dicey. Um, and you know, it was frustrating for us in this meeting because we were like, you've been running for president our entire lives. So like, you should be able to talk about the police, right? You should be able to talk about, you should be able to talk about all of this. It was a hard meeting. The second meeting we had was excellent. Um, but what I will say about Hillary, and I'll talk about the second meeting because I was just a little, uh, more positive. Uh, we met with her in like a swing space in Cleveland is that she actually understood the issues incredibly well. Not that you would know because she did very few interviews that were about content. She did a lot of interviews that were about culture. Like the only question, the only time she ever asked, answered a question about the police in an interview was when Mary J. Blige did that ridiculous interview on Apple Music, if any of you remember. And that is offensive to so many people that like the only time you answer a question about the police is with Mary J. Blige, no, no knock to Mary. But Mary just doesn't know the content. You know, she did two big podcasts and they were about culture, it wasn't about content. But the second time we met with her, I remember asking her, Hillary, you know, you have this whole platform about police training and we don't think that money should go to police departments. We think that if any money, if anything has to be invested in police training, it should go to community members and it should go to providers that are not in the police department. And she said, I completely agree. 
I think that makes a lot of sense. And she had like a whole rationale for why she agreed. And what was frustrating about the meeting is that we asked her team to videotape it so that we could show people because we knew by me and Brittany just meeting with her alone that people would be like, well, you guys think you're really important and da, da, da. so we knew it. So we said, let's record it so that we can make sure everybody sees what happened. Her team said yes. And then after the meeting, they sent me this Dropbox, links, Dropbox link that is so heavily edited that it was offensive. Like I called them back being like, you know, Hillary was great. Like she really didn't, and she was exceptional in a way that she was not at this meeting. And I was so proud. And it was just like they, the team, her team was so cautious in ways that I think hurt her in the end. So you think about Bernie, is Killer Mike was out there for Bernie. There are people who didn't even know who Killer Mike was. You think about Katrina Pearson, we had no clue who Katrina was before this election. But Katrina with that bullet necklace was like delivering those touches. She was like, what wall? Trump never said anything about a wall. You're like, Katrina. Like, but with Hillary, it's like, who was delivering the message? I don't know. Like, there wasn't somebody delivering the message. And also internally in the campaign, there were so many mixed messages. And I do think that that contributed to the challenges she had. But I will tell you from my last meeting, like she actually understood the issues. It wasn't Maya. Maya um, who is Kamala's sister, was her chief policy advisor on criminal justice. And Maya, we knew Maya was smart. Maya used to run the ACLU in California. Like, we knew she got it, but it was like, does Hillary get it? And she actually did. And it was so frustrating when we didn't get the video because Hillary was, you know, if anything, the police would have hated her because she was just so on point with, like, everything we asked. It was incredible. Um, but I say this because there are people who think that you should never sit at the table. And we thought that it was important to push from the inside and the outside. And we pushed both of their teams. Maya on the policy team on Hillary's side, we had many conversations with her. The people who couldn't be in this room, we set up conference calls so they could push the team directly. And the same thing with Bernie. This meeting with President Obama um, was interesting. We met with him twice. The longest meeting that President Obama ever had in the White House as president was actually with us. And it was not this meeting. It was a second meeting that we had. This was the first intergenerational meeting of civil rights leaders uh, that the president had ever hosted. And um, that's C.T. Vivian, if any of you know C.T. Vivian. And you know, what's funny about the White House is that, well, what, was, what was funny about the White House, <laughs> not many things are funny, <laughs> is that people have a lot of fight before they go into the room with the president. So they're like, I'm gonna tell him, da, da, da. and then they get in the room and literally it's like, thank you, Mr. President. And you're like, <laughs> Y'all just talked the big game out there. Um, but what was so interesting, one of the things that's interesting about Obama is that people were just so in awe of him. Like C.T. Vivian literally talked about the importance of Obama for 10 minutes. And Obama had to say, he was like, C.T., I appreciate it. Like, <laughs> let's get to the issues. And you're like, okay. Now what I, the only thing that I'll really say about President Obama is really about the protesters, is that me and Brittany were in this meeting and somebody from the NWCP, uh, Mary from um, Sharpton's team, there were other young people. And then the second meeting we had was with mayors and police chiefs from across the country. Um, and it was probably like 25 people. And what was incredible is that the protesters always brought the truth into the room. So in the second meeting, there was a protester from uh, the Twin Cities and then there was a police chief from St. Paul. And I don't know how, but they started yelling at each other across the room. And it's, the, it's his meeting. It's not, I'm not saying anything to anybody, right? So he lets it go. And like he looks at the protest and he says, you know, I want to make sure that you are heard. So let me know what you want me to hear. Because we all get to go around and he's sort of pushing back on people. And she eventually says her piece and he mispronounces her name. And she goes, that is not my name, Mr. President. And he is like... I appreciate that, I'm sorry. And he repeats it, and it was like this moment where, and she wasn't, and she like loved him. But it was this moment of like, we bring the truth everywhere we go, and that we don't compromise on the truth about the police or about who we are. And she was saying to him like, people mispronounce your name your entire life and you never let that stand, and like, please pronounce mine right. And like, she said other things about the police that were also incredible, but it was this moment of like, what does it mean to bring the truth in the room every time? And with Bernie at the end, he said, did I earn your vote? And there was somebody who spoke for us and she said no. And he said, what do I have to do? She said, I don't know, but today was not it. And it was like this moment, and like she wasn't being mean, but she was saying like, I don't want you to walk out of here thinking that you nailed it because you did not nail it, right? <laughs> and when I think about what it means to sit at the table, it is always about bringing the truth. It's not about our ego, it's not about our personalities, it's not about our platform, it's about how can we make sure that we bring the truth. And what we did with Hillary, because by the time we did that meeting with her, there was no platform, she hadn't released anything. So what we did for two weeks before that meeting is that we took every single public statement that she had made about the issues and we sort of made a platform for her so that we knew exactly what she said and when she said it. 
And then we had prep calls with everybody who was gonna be in that meeting so that they knew the issues too. And then after that meeting, we sent her team our prep stuff so they had all of our issues too. And that's the stuff that you never saw, but it, but it was important to us, right? That this wasn't about a photo. It wasn't about just sitting at the table. It was about making sure that we pressed the issues. Now, this idea of ask the biggest question. So when people think about the police, when they think about the movement, they often think about the police. But we think about this issue of safety. So there will always be rules. There will be people who break the rules. And there will be consequences. We fundamentally think that these things will be true for time immemorial. The question becomes, what are the consequences? Who enforces the consequences? And what are the worst consequences? And that's a conversation about what safety looks like. Like, I'm open to the police not being the people who enforce the consequences. Let's think of something different. I'm open to the harshest consequence not being death or life in prison. Let's think about that differently. Like, this is what the work is. It's not about how do we fight the police. The police are just like a cog in this machine about the bigger question of what is safety. And too often we start with the small question first because thinking about like how do we fix the police is like an easier, it's a more tangible thing. But all of that rolls up to the big questions that our belief statements actually roll from. And then the simple truths. So there, I was on a panel once and a police officer said, well, DeRay, when should the police be able to kill somebody? And I asked her, well, when should the police be able to kill your child? And she didn't have anything to say. And I said, well, when you answer it, then I'll answer it, right? And that question for me was about how do, how do we say this in the simplest terms? That when people talk to me about like the protests and da da da, is that I tell them the only simple truth I know is that Mike should be alive today. That that is true, right? <laughs> and I would say that in the work of organizing, sometimes we overdo it that we have like the 10,000 word answer to everything, as opposed to just like sitting down in the simple truth. People, everybody should read. They should be able to read. People shouldn't be in prisons for X amount of time. People shouldn't die in jail. Like those are just like the simple truths. And I would say too often, we just don't start from the simple truths. We get to the simple truth when we've exhausted everything else, but we should start at the simple truth. When you think about the death panels, that is such an easy talking point in the right. And the left's response is like a 15,000 word essay. And you're like, Nobody gets it. They don't get it, right? When I think about healthcare, I think that there are people who understand now more than ever that they want healthcare. Do they know anything more about healthcare? Questionable, right? So how do we help people actually understand the issues well enough so that they can fight for them? And then this is about you, the designers. So I think about this question of freedom as an urgency around our imagination. So like I said earlier, if you can't imagine it, then you can't fight for it. And this question of what does it look like in the future, what does freedom actually look like is a question of what does it look like, what does it feel like, what does it sound like, that these are the things that I want to believe that our designers and our artists actually do for us. That we think about art as both a window and a mirror, a window helping us see what could be, and a mirror helping us see who we are. And that at our best, it helps us think about what the world could look like. That like, what would it feel like to be free? What would it sound like to walk outside and like to experience joy and justice every day? That those are things that our dreamers should do for us. That so many people have the absence of oppression piece down. They are fighting the good fight to make sure the bad things aren't bad anymore. But there are people who have been seduced by this idea of burn it down. And there are a lot of people who are like, we should start over. We should burn the system down. We should, we should topple it. And the reality is that we never start from the Garden of Eden again. That we will always start from the ashes. And we will lose if we start from the ashes, that we won't win in that scenario. So this isn't to say that I don't think we should be aggressive. I think we should. I believe that we can transform this system, that it can be something radically different. And I believe that because people made this, that this wasn't divine, and justice wasn't divine. And because people made it, we can remake it. And the seduction with the burn it down, I think, takes for granted that in burning it down, we will not concomitantly burn down racism, or sexism, or patriarch. Those things won't burn when capitalism falls. That like we will never start from the Garden of Eden, we will always start from the ashes. But I have faith that it'll be you who help us think about what it looks like, what it feels like, and what it sounds like. I hope to see you on the other side of freedom. Thank you.
Are we on? Hello? Hello. Hi, everyone. Um, so I want to echo what everyone has said before and thank uh, Harvard GSD and the AASU for putting on this event. Um, it is, I mean, everybody said it's so beautiful to look out and see this crowd, but I also really want to emphasize how unique it is um, and how unusual it is and how we can go through long stretches of our careers and sometimes our entire career and never see a crowd that looks back at us like this, right? It's a, such a unique moment. It's very powerful. Uh, Before we start, let's shout yes. out your dad, who's yes. here. Yes. So thank Mr. you. Ronnie. I would be remiss. Um, my <laughs> dad is here. Um, so I am the daughter of a 40-plus year visual designer who is here oh. with his students from Bowie State. And so in many ways, this conversation of black and design started from my childhood. Like, my very root lesson was you were not supposed to play with Prismacolors. Those are not the same thing as your Crayolas. Like, <laughs> put those down. So, um, you know, have to give props to dad. Um, and so we also, um, Dre and I talked, we know that there's a lot of questions. We want this to be more of a conversation. So we're actually going to open it up to questions relatively early, OK? So I'm going to kick us off with a couple of questions. We're going to go straight into audience Q&A. And then I'll sort of build off of those questions as we go so we can make this more of a discussion and conversation and so that we can get to you all's thoughts and questions for Dre sooner rather than later, right? Does that sound good? Um, so I'm trying to think of where to start, right? Um, and DeRay and I sort of sit in this similar space of straddling between policy and organizing and putting things into actual change and implementation. Um, and so I think at the end, you were talking about um, the role of designers. And I was curious about what your experience has been so far and how designers have been a part of organizing, movement building, and policy making and being at the table? Be it narrative, be it oppositional, like where have you engaged designers and where do you think you could engage them differently or want to see them engage differently? Yeah, so I think that the easiest is obviously the, like the visual designers who make like the graphics and the t-shirts and things like that. Uh, I'm friends with the guy who did Gaga's meat dress and he did, um, I, because I wear this vest every day, when people give me t-shirts, it doesn't really mean anything because I wear a vest every day. So he made um, these jeans for me that like had facts on them. And that was like really cool because I finally felt like I could participate in t-shirt culture, you know? It's like, I have t-shirts. But I think about there's so many amazing like memes and graphics and those sort of things have been incredible. I remember at the school system in Baltimore, we're renovating every single school in the portfolio. So to see the designers come in and think about for the first time like, what do poor black kids in inner city Baltimore deserve in terms of educational spaces? Like, what should their classrooms look like? And like, how should they have access to sunlight? Things that our families literally had never ever thought they were worthy of was like incredible, you know? So you, you see a school being built and it's like all sunlight and people are literally like, I've never walked in a building like that before. And like, that was wild to see happen, you know? I think too about playgrounds. And again, just cause I'm from Baltimore, it's like, we were doing this play playground reconstruction and all of a sudden for the first time we were mapping out like where were playgrounds and where, where, where they weren't. And it was fascinating to see like how design played into the way that people thought about what they were worth in our city. And I'm always reminded of that. Um, so why don't we, can we go ahead and start queuing up the first ones? Um. Hi, my name is Chloe Moore and I'm from Memphis, Tennessee. We have, I guess, a city that in a lot of ways parallels St. Louis, right? And in the past, I don't know, couple years, we've had a lot of demonstrations and things like that that we've participated in or organized. There was one moment I remember in particular where, so to just give a little context, organizing or participating in that has been terrifying for me, but I think that that work is necessary, so I show up. And I think about the ways in which the body is oftentimes a source of political warfare, especially for black people. And there was this moment where we are having another protest or another march for refugees and immigrants and showing that solidarity. And these white women behind me were skipping and saying, oh, this is so fun, we should protest more often, right? I start bawling 
right? Because for me, this was terrifying. It was putting my body on the line. There are police everywhere. I also heard women earlier saying, how nice the police showed up. I'm thinking, are you shitting me? Um, and so it just made me have this moment of thinking about people who do this as their profession. And I actually thought about you. And during my time in college at a predominantly white institution and bringing Black Lives Matter to that space, I thought about you often. I read about things um, that you were saying and the ways in which I look to you almost as like that guiding star for me. And so to have you here and to be in an audience where you are right here for me is just overwhelming. And I'm trying to keep it together right now. I've been freaking out all day. I <laughs> uh, but I just wanted to say thank you, um, truly from the bottom of my heart and anything I could offer for putting your body in that space and for putting yourself out there for encouraging and inspiring and for just being a source of light in a time that is really confusing. And so I don't really have any questions, <laughs> to be honest. You're like, so I sweet. just thank you. <laughs> I'll say three quick things. One is thank you. Two is I'm mindful that I was one of many people, right? That, that the movement uh, was, was begun and has been sustained because so many people made a commitment and made a sacrifice, and I'm thankful and grateful to be one of them. Um, and I'm always reminded of that, that like I did not do anything alone, and none of us got here alone, that like we are all here because so many other people believe too. And the third is that protest has become cool for people. I was at this um, dinner with Holder, and it was like the six of us. And he was like, DeRay, it's so great to see people at the airports. And I'm like, oh, really? Because when we were out in the street, you were, the DOJ was not like, it's so great to see people out in the street, you know? <laughs> but like protest has become this American thing. Now, I remember being on the news like in August of 2014 and 15, like defending everything we did. You know, they're like, I remember I did this one interview the um, the news like happened to be at a place and protesters were fighting each other like there was a fist fight, and the news like had amazing footage of it. So I get on the news talking about something else, and she like puts up this image of people fighting, and she's like, "Deray, but I thought you said this was nonviolent." And I'm like, "Oh, you tried to get me," and uh, you know, I said, "Me and my sister fought all the time as kids, and I never questioned my love for her." And like, but I think about that as like we spent so much time defending the protesters, and now it's like white people are out there, and we're like, you know, protest is America, and you're like, that is wild. So I think that that is, uh, I think you are spot on about that observation. Uh, and the question I think for me becomes, will white people care when Trump is not president, right? So the thing that he has done is that, I think about the Muslim ban was the first time that some people realized the country was unjust. They're like, wow, this is bad. And we're like, it's been bad, right? <laughs> but like, will people understand that and believe that when the trauma is not so overt? I think that one, of, and I didn't talk about this up here, but I do think that we organize a lot around loud trauma, that when the trauma is the loudest, we organize the most. But the quiet trauma does as much damage, and we just don't organize around the quiet trauma. So we don't organize around what it looks like that the three biggest mental health institutions are jails. Like people, you don't see that as much, you know? Or like the drug free school zones are all bad in every neighborhood. They're literally just mandatory minimums. Like people aren't organizing around that stuff because it's not loud trauma, and I do worry about that. And, and so you've talked about some in, in your, in your um, speech about protest as being a tactic. Right, and for those who are less familiar with organizing, strategy, getting to policy and systems level change, right? This is really about getting to those big questions. How do you think about where protest fits, when it fits, and when it's not appropriate? Yeah, so I, I probably should have done this up there, but this question of like, what is power? That power is the ability to influence the decision-making process, and that politics is the decision-making process. So we know that there are many ways to build power. That standing in the street is one way that like we are forcing a system to respond to us because we put our bodies in the street. That like I think about protests as telling the truth in public. So when we tell the truth with our bodies in the middle of the street, that we are forcing response and we're participating in the decision making process in that way. But there are other ways to do it. So being inside the system is one way to do it. I think about this was one of my last fights with President Obama. You know, he he kept saying, like, you should vote and you should vote. And I said, President Obama, you know, I voted my entire life and still got tear gas, arrested, maced, pepper sprayed. Like, voting wasn't the thing that just, like, cured everything, which doesn't mean that we shouldn't vote. But it does mean that, and I, this was my push to him, and he just disagreed. It was my same push to Hillary. Is that, like, if you posit voting as, like, one way to build power, I think that people will understand that better. But when you posit it as, 
like the way to build power. I think that, that people are just turning off. Like you have, you're trying to shame people into voting and that just like isn't the way to do it. And I worry about that. So when I think about like what tactic is the best, I think that the context matters, but I'm mindful that there are many ways to participate in the decision-making process and that protest is important, that people need to push from the outside, that sitting at the table is important. I think about being the chief human capital is that on the inside that people never tell you that the most random people giving feedback actually have a huge impact. And last year, so I was in charge of all hiring for the school system and all staffing. And probably like eight days into school, the superintendent gets this email that's like, my kid is in a class with 40 kindergartners and one teacher. She sends it to me and she's like, to refix it. And like literally because of that one email, we like put another teacher in the classroom. We split the classes. It wasn't because the principal called us. It wasn't because anybody in the school called us. It wasn't because two parents emailed us. It was literally that one woman. We never followed up with her because like systems just don't, right? Like we don't, we don't want you to know that you have all this power because like <laughs> that's how the system works. But it was literally like this one email is why we changed the staffing in that school. And like people just don't participate sometimes because they don't realize the power they have. And systems are designed to make you think that one of the things that oppression does is makes you think that you don't have power when you do. And we think about what it means to empower people. It's like, I can't give you power. What I can do is help you understand the power you already have. And that's what it means to empower people. Um, oh, read that. Is it on? I can't oh. tell. Um, DeRay, thank you. I can. Um, so I had a question. I, I come to events like this, and I think a lot about capture. I think a lot about in terms of what we take away and how we make that actionable. I think about who's in the room, who's not in the room. Um, I also think about power dynamics. So many of these conversations, to your point about the analogy for Eden, you know, it's it's. I come across this challenge, therefore I need to construct a new stadium without an understanding of a historical context and perhaps a framework which can allow you to make incremental progress off of, let's say, a first down marker as opposed to constructing something from the ground up. And so power relies on that stadium never getting built, right? And so I think a lot about, I wonder about your work and, and the work you've seen how much of this is collaborative? I, you know, I'm in spaces around technology access looking forward. We're not in a lot of those pipelines, right? So then I think about the value of our historical context and what we have behind us. But to a degree, there's a timeline on some of that, right? We think about the folks that have been organizers in our community. And I just wonder kind of where that space exists for us to really gain those insights on, on the strategies that have worked, the strategies that haven't even been tried, and kind of where you see those conversations happening in the spaces that you're at um, and around. Yeah, I think about, and this sounds so hokey, I feel like a sixth grade math teacher again, but uh, that really it is like the people struggle to imagine. I, I'm trying to figure out housing, uh, public housing waiting lists. I'm fascinated with the public housing waiting list. So if any of you are experts on public housing waiting lists, please see me afterwards, because I'm fascinated. <laughs> but I called this, <laughs> yes, I, I, called, I called this expert, and my proposition to her was if I gave you $2 billion and told you that we had to exhaust the waiting list in one year without recreating the projects, what would you do? Like trying to just fig I just needed to brainstorm with somebody without the constraints. Like how would you, what would you do? I gave you all the money. You couldn't put people on projects, but we had to like get everybody off the waiting list and give them out. Like how would you do it? And we talked for 40 minutes and like she just literally couldn't, she just couldn't imagine a world without those constraints. Like she just, so she's like, but DeRay, like the projects. And I'm like, not the projects. And she's <laughs> like, but you know, mixed income housing. I'm like, well, I don't think that our city, can, like, do you think that we can, like, can we sustain that? Like, can you, can you build enough ho mixed income housing to do it? She's like, well, no. And it's like, but trying to get people to like, just think without the constraints is actually really hard. And like, I think that that is, I think that the question is not where are the spaces? It's like, what are we doing in the spaces? I think is like the bigger question. And so many of the spaces, we spend 99% of the time talking about how bad it is. And like 1% of the time talking about how we could do something about it. And you know, I had another conversation with somebody on the racial wealth gap, which I'm also, we're trying to figure out policy solutions. And like, I didn't know, I don't know if I said this to you already, Kim, but I didn't know that the post office used to be a bank until the 70s, I had no clue. And that people think about that as closing the banking deserts, right? That like, because post offices are everywhere and they used to give out loans, that if there are places where they're not banks, you have a post office, like that could actually do that for people in communities. I thought that was interesting. And then she also was like, you know, I hate when people talk about financial literacy. And I said, why? And she was like, because the reality is that poor people probably know how to manage their money better than anybody in the middle class, yes. right? Because $10 will be the difference between like housing and no housing. So it's not that people aren't literate. It's not that they like don't understand 
the world, it's that they literally don't have access to capital, right? That like, so the Band-Aid becomes financial literacy that actually doesn't get us anywhere near the scale solution. And that we punt on the scale solution because people haven't like, and I said to her, when she said the post office thing, I was like, I couldn't, I like never imagined that, that like the post office could be a bank. I was like, shut up, you know? And like, <laughs> but how do we make our spaces spaces where we dream again and we dream by design, right? Like not by happenstance, not because you have some crazy person in the room who just is annoying and they keep pressing you, but like that's your orientation. And I, I think that we actually don't do that. We talk about it a lot. I think we don't do that. Um, yeah, Jason Minter. Um, I'm a community and economic developer over in uh, Cleveland. Um, my question is related to in design spaces, there is a framework for participatory design. Um, I think a lot of us kind of know what that is at this point, but I, I feel like there's a, um, an opportunity to expand that participation into implementation and uh, ownership. Where, where it kind of falls short as soon as we have the feedback and it's like, now let's go do our work. Um, so. Where do you see uh, designers or, or kind of the implementers, the people in the, at the table you're, as you're kind of outlining in your talk, um, including more folks in the actual implementation and, and ultimate ownership of, of what we're trying to build? Yeah, I'd be interested, you know, one of the signs of the best organizers is your proximity to the work, right? So for people, like if you can go to a prisoner jail, you should go to a prisoner jail. If you can like mentor a kid and you care about education, you should mentor, like the closer you can get, however your world is configured, you should do that. And I think about, so I went to Angola, which is a huge, it's the largest prison in the country, landmass, and then Cook County is the largest jail in Chicago. And I went to Cook County and I'll never forget just like being, like I already believe that we should take everybody out of jail, that we should like figure out how to make sure that like people aren't in jail who shouldn't be separated from society. But then I went and I'm just like, let everybody out, right? Like you should just like <laughs> open the doors, we'll figure it out. Like to the, because it's not until you see it that you're like, this is even in, more inhumane than like anything I'd ever read or like anything on TV, it's just wild. And I think about so many of the people in those spaces to get to your question, like mental health professionals, they like totally care about the population and da da da, like the best of them. But there's like a real gap in like dreaming about anything else. So I think about like I could see designers coming to jails and just thinking about how to like reorient the space differently, right? From like the way the tables look or like the way that power is constructed. Like those things are really important. And I know some people are already doing that, but the barrier to entry is actually not as hard as you think it is. Like we could, like there are more spaces that I think you are. Um, your thoughts would be welcome in, and you might have to be the person that invites yourself, though, which is a challenge, right? There's so many people who run, like, I think about being the chief of human capital. I spend 80% of my time, like, getting us to tomorrow. So, like, I was responsible for, like, our health care. We had 20,000 people in our health care plan, like, all staffing. I was the only person that could fire people. So, like, I spent all day, like, trying that teacher that hit that kid. I'm like, you got to go. Like, did it, you know, like, that was, that was my day, you know? So I wasn't, I spent, like, 20% of my time trying to think about, like, the next big thing. And it'd be interesting to figure out how do we build it so that you can invite yourself into some spaces. I think that'd be interesting. And so how do you think about balancing that when you're, when you're in the job, right? You have a job, you've got to do the daily grind. How do you find the space to take a step back and ask the bigger questions that get you to really different, innovative ideas and solutions? Because otherwise, we just end up sort of chugging along, right? Solving yesterday's problem, solving today's f fire. But at some point, we've all got to take a step back and say, there's a bigger question here, right? Yeah, I think the government's a little different. And if any of you who work for the government, you know. It's hard <laughs> sometimes. Uh, I think in the private sector, I've just seen it be easier because you can, teams just look different. But, I, you know, in Baltimore, what I would say is that some of it was like, how do we fix like the basic stuff, right? So that we can do the other stuff. So when I first got there, I was supposed to do three months as a human capital officer and I stayed for a year. And after three months, we thought we had a replacement and it just didn't work out. So I told the superintendent who I believe in and she's incredible, I said, I'll stay until we find a replacement. So it took a year. When I first got there, they were like, Dre, uh, the, I was the, I'm the first human capital officer in 15 years not to get fired. So everybody else had gotten fired. In the last, the person two before me got fired because on the first payday, people just didn't get their paychecks. So there was a line like around the building for paychecks. <laughs> And we don't do, our finance department, which did not report to me, cannot do direct deposit on the first pay. So every single new employee gets a paper check. Mind you, we have 11,000 employees. So I get hired, to, and she's like, DeRay, please fix this. And the superintendent before her used to always say, nobody ever gets fired because kids don't learn. People always get fired for like the human capital stuff. So like paychecks, retirement, stuff like that. 
So I call this meeting with everybody who's in charge of the paycheck, like who has some proximity to the paycheck thing. And I'm like, just talk me through it. It's like 30 of us in this tight room. And they're like, well, Dre, the checks get cut and we send the vans out to the schools. We have 180 vans. I mean, 180 schools. I say, how many vans? They say five. I'm like, okay. So I'm like, just like walk me through this, right? <laughs> and so I'm like, van gets to the school. What happens? And they're like, well, we call from the van to the secretary. The secretary comes and gets the checks. And I say, oh, okay. Now, what if the secretary doesn't answer? They say, well, we go to the next school. I'm like, oh, this is bad, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> so I'm like, okay, five vans, 180 schools. And I'm like, well, when do you get back to the build? Like, how does that work? And they're like, four o'clock. I'm like, well, 75% of our schools are out by four o'clock. So like, how would they know that they didn't get their check? Like, how would this? And they're like, that's a good question. I'm like, that is not a good question, right? Like, <laughs> I think I'm smart, but this wasn't me being smart, right? So literally, we put two people in every van, and we have um, uh, like um, we have forty people total come to the building. You know what I mean? And it like didn't take genius. It literally was like let's just start at the basic, right? Like what is like how do the checks get delivered? And then we ran these reports that were like who had no time enter for them, and anybody that didn't have time enter, we called and we're like you didn't enter time for so and so. And like they were really basic fixes that like it didn't require me to come in and do, but like people just hadn't done them. When I think about how we create space for like the strategic stuff, is I like, get the basic stuff just done so it's not a problem anymore. Okay. There, back like your there. shirt. Design is my superpower. Yep. It's a cool shirt. <laughs> I can go. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so much uh, for coming here. It's been an incredible um, presentation and it's. Um, Incredible to have your body here. Um, something that I'm really interested in as a landscape architect is understanding uh, how we as designers on our like every day, you know, how we practice and the drawings we put together and the spaces we built uh, start to think about uh, brown and black bodies um, while we're protesting. How does the design of our streetscapes, of our plazas of our environments uh, create safe spaces uh, for black and brown bodies to feel safe. Um, and uh, I, I want to quote uh, Darnell Moore, who um, wrote a piece uh, with Tony Griffith on the Just City. And he's like, imagine dialogues um, about neighborhood development and urban design occurring among protest participants while these events are happening. So how do we start to think about these things that we do on a day-to-day -day basis and how the design of these public spaces really influences um, the safety and, and the success of um, these uh, bodies protesting uh, in our cities? Yeah, I don't, you know, it's funny because I can only think about this as a protester. So, like, I remember the protests in Baltimore were so different because it's all, it's, Baltimore's a city of row houses, right? So in St. Louis, we could, like, run between things when they shot tear gas. And then in Baltimore, you're, like, just hoping you don't get hit. You know, like, there's no, it's, like, it's all row houses. So you're just like, yeah. No, or at least where the protests were. So I don't know, you know, I don't know what the role of sort of city planners would be in that. I, I do think there's something interesting. I was talking to Jack, um, who is at Twitter, and he was talking about SimCity as like the first, um, SimCity is like one of the things that helped him believe that he could build things, right? And I, I remember my like own love for SimCity. I remember like building cities being like, wow, like I could do this. And I think about how few spaces I've ever been in where I see that aren't like because of a government role or something that I see people like help us imagine like what housing could look like, like just differently, right? Like what would it, what would it look like? How could I build a neighborhood and like start from that level and like be with people in community as opposed to what I think often happens is we're like, well, this is awful. How do we fix this? Is like sort of like people's orientation to change in at the neighborhood level as opposed to like what would a what would a beautiful school look like and I think about that with, with us in Baltimore like we started with communities from like what would a great school look like for your kid as opposed to like how do we take this building we're renovating and change it which is like such a different way to be in the space and like when you see architects or landscape planners talk I remember the window thing just stands out being like what if we have sunlight come in here? Like, I just remember, and I'm like, I feel like I'm at a lot of tables and I had never thought about like kids access to sunlight because all the schools in Baltimore are old and dark anyway, right? So like I, I didn't grow up in a school where like there was sunlight. I haven't seen many schools where there's less sunlight. So you know, I hadn't thought about that. And I think that that could be interesting to help people like imagine from the beginning. The protest question, you know, I would love for everything to have places where people can run and hide. And like, I think that, you know, 
you can build those. I think that the, <laughs> I think that the hardest city, the hardest city I think for the, the protesters is Baltimore only because there wasn't space between houses and it was just different. So like when they shot smoke bombs, if you were there, like there was no, like you were just stuck. Whereas in Ferguson, in St. Louis City, in North Charleston, in all the other places, they were just more spread out. So like you could just move around differently. The next, there's somebody else that had the mic back there. Hi, um, my name is Cassandra Thompson. I work at Sasaki, um, and uh, I had to write my question down so I don't mess it up. Um, but looking at all the faces that are at this conference, um, there are so many generations here represented, which is incredibly exciting. Um, I am a millennial, as are many of us, and we're known for a lot of things, including being impatient. Um, and uh, I think that it is often connected to lack of respect or lack of perspective. Um, and as a designer, and as designers, we're often put in situations we, where we're taught that social impact or our political um, views are less important than perhaps the form of a building um, or of, uh, of something relating to the output of the artwork. And what I'm wondering is if you have any specific advice uh, to help us sort of get through that. Uh, this political climate has been uh, sometimes overwhelming for so many of us, and it's just a sort of daily struggle sometimes. Yeah, the impatience thing is interesting. The, the three things. One is that the generational thing is that there's some people who want to be our parents more than they want to be our peers, right? So like you sit at the table and they really only want to lecture you. They don't really care about what you have to say. And like, I think that is real. The second is that I think impatience is a tactic sometimes and doesn't have to be your only way of entering the world. That like, there are a lot of tables, if you sit at them and you go and being like, you know, we'll accept the 30 year plan, they will give you the 70 year plan, right? Was you go and being like, I want this tomorrow, then people are like, okay, well, let us, we can't do tomorrow, but let us talk about it in two weeks. And you're like, you know what, I'm fine with two weeks actually, right? So I think about impatience as a tactic more than I think about it as like a fixed position. And in terms of the sort of the value of your work, one of the things that I'm reminded of, and that's why that DM is, it was interesting to me because when I thought about, like, there are some instances where I know that we helped make them sort of national news. I think about in Charleston, I mean, no, Charlottesville, when the white people with tiki torches were there the night before, I remember I just got home from dinner. I get this call from an organizer at UVA, because remember at UVA was when Martise Johnson got beat up. So she calls, and I haven't talked to her since Martise got beat up, because I know her from then. And she's like, Duran, I need to talk. And I'm like, give me two seconds. I just kind of She's like, no, I need to talk now. And she's like, there are white people on campus with tiki torches. And I'm like, Tassara, did you see the white people, or did somebody tell you they're white people? Because like, if I tweet there are people with tiki torches and they're not, then I'll like, it'll be the next week is like Duran lied about white people with tiki torches. <laughs> so she's like, no, I like got a call. I drove over and I saw white people with tiki torches on campus. And I'm like, Tassara, I don't see anything on Twitter about it. Like, I Google. Like, there's no, are you sure there are people with Tiki George on campus? And she's like, I'm positive. And I like find this one reporter who had just gotten down there who took this photo. So I like tweet the photo and I'm like, white people on campus with Tiki torches, right? <laughs> and like, those are moments that I think about like knowing for sure that like we helped get people to see that there was a problem and like they didn't see before. I think about Martise, two UVA stories, but like there were all these kids tweeting being like, our friend just got beat up. And, he was like, you know, I don't, I haven't, nobody, I was Googling Martise's name, it wasn't the news, da, da, da. And I give this girl my phone number, she calls, and she's like hysterical. And I'm saying to her, like, is this your friend? Do you know him? And she's like, yeah. And I'm like, are you sure? And she's like, yeah. So I call the president's office at UVA. I don't know what, you know, I was really ballsy back then. So I call, <laughs> and I'm like, do you have a statement about the beating of Martise Johnson? Literally, that's what I say. And they're like, uh, communications. And I'm like, uh. So I go to communications, and I'm like, do you have a statement about the beating of Martise Johnson? And she's like, I'll email you. And I'm like, okay, well, if you would email me, then something clearly happened. So then we start tweeting about Martise and news reporters are calling us being like, what happened to Martise? I'm like, I don't know. I've never been to UVA. I don't know the kid, but like, here's some other people. And I say those as examples of like, I know we had an impact. The Las Vegas one was interesting because like, I actually didn't know that it mattered at all that I said anything about Las Vegas until she sent me that message. And in terms of like, how to know that you have value, that you're adding value, it's like one of the things I remind myself is that this work will always be more important than it is popular. And like, I'll, I won't always get the feedback, right? That like, we do the work because it's the right work and we know it's the right work. 
and that that will lend its own rewards. And like, we might not be able to see it in that moment, but like, we know we're doing our right work. And like, that's what keeps me sane because we won't always get the feedback loop. So like the best designers I know have done some stuff that like have touched a couple communities and they never knew. And it didn't have the, they didn't get the feedback loop that they wanted, but like it actually did make an impact. And when we launched Campaign Zero, you know, it was the first platform that came out nationally in the movement. And like, there are people all across the country who use it. And we didn't know people are using it until the website went down one day. And then we get all these emails being like, I need it for a presentation. We're like, wow, people are using it for presentations, right? But like, if we had taken it down because we didn't get the feedback that we wanted in the beginning, we never would have been able to have an impact. Some up here in the, oh, okay. And then we'll come up here. Hi, Dore. Uh, my name is Douglas Davis. Um, I want to go back to the role of graphic designers and art directors in the work of protest. Um, could you talk a little bit more about the process of partnering with creatives um, in terms of like in terms of like visualizing the big questions or articulating the simple truths? I'm thinking about like the Black Lives Matter, uh, J. Walter Thompson collaboration. Uh, I'm not sure whether you were involved with that, but also what comes to mind is the hashtag no more black targets uh, campaign, just in looking at um, the fact that trained shooters learn how to shoot by l shooting black silhouettes, and they're sort of questioning whether the implicit sort of bias of shooting black bodies has something to do with learning how to shoot uh, a black silhouette, and therefore, they're trying to create art out of those black silhouettes so that there are no more black targets. Um, I think it's just important to talk about if there are places for us as designers or art directors specifically to go to partner to offer our skills up in this room. Thanks. Yeah, I think about, I'm always, I think that when we lose aunts and uncles, we lose the movement. Like that is like a core belief. So when I think about some of the art that I've seen, I don't know who, I know it's not targeting aunts and uncles, right? So there's some incredible pieces that like you go to a museum and see and they like make me think differently. And I'm like, wow, that's really interesting. And I could write a phenomenal paper on it. I don't know if it's actually like changing people's hearts and minds or helping them think about the world differently. I know that if I was a designer and like I could, you know, do anything besides send emails being like, please make this thing for us. Um, I think some of the simple stuff is like stuff that people don't, you know, there's a city, Kansas, I think, uh, there's a city in Kansas that has, it's called like the number one question, and it's like, is it good for the kids? And it's everywhere, it's like how they make decisions, and it's like, is it good for the kids, right? And I think about things like that that are just like simple, that like people at their dining room table, like they get it, you know? So some of the police stats, some of the stuff about healthcare, like if I could design things, I would try and figure out like how to, make distill these complex messages into things that like aunts and uncles could like give out at church and like like that's always like as an organizer like that's the target audience and i think that because spaces like this are already access to them is already hard enough that like sometimes you only get the organizers who are like intellectuals self-avowed intellectuals so they have you guys do all this stuff that is like really cool for museums which is like should exist museums are beautiful things but like in terms of the organizing work like you know, like there are a lot of communities that have never thought about like how the neighborhood could look different. Like they complain about gentrification, but like it'd be dope to have a flyer that's like your neighborhood could look like this, right? Like people literally have never seen an image of a neighborhood that looked different. Like that to me would be like the guerrilla warfare designer, you know, like like forcing people to imagine the world differently and doing it in a way that like everybody can understand and not just in museums. And uh, I know there are some, um, some artists and graphic designers who have started to have those interactive communications in neighborhoods where you'll show up at a space and all of a sudden there's a board and it's like, what would you like to see here, right? And you're starting that conversation vis-a-vis -vis art in a community. It's a very different, very powerful thing as opposed to a community meeting, right? Which is, is a different kind of access point. Yeah. And giving people things to respond to. You know, sometimes I like can't, Im I can imagine like a better world. Sometimes I can't imagine like the look like part of it, you know? And like sometimes you can. And I, I know that we've been in spaces and I've seen designers and stuff. I'm like, that is, I never would have, like, that was incredible, right? So like, you don't need somebody to tell you like what to do in the beginning, but like you can give people things to respond to. Like I just did a visit at the Cook County Jail um, and it was young people like making art that was, they, it was just like impressive to see it with no guidance. They had anything to respond. Like it was beautiful, you know? And I think about like, what would it look like to bring designers there to give them feedback, right? That like those sort of things that, it's only with black people that we think that love, like love is the only ingredient. So it's like, 
you know, after school programs, whole lot of love. Like no skills, just love, right? Like love's gonna get people out of poverty. And when we think about like the skill stuff, is like what if there were designers like partnering with jails and stuff like that and like just helping people think about their art and their world and their skills differently? Like I was an after school provider and like the people that wanted to work in after school providers were like a subset of people who wanted to change the world. And it was like, it was, they were like camp counselors, you know what I mean? Which is great. And like, we should have camp counselors. There are very few people who were like designers. I love camp counselors. If any of you were camp counselors, that's great. <laughs> but like, what would it look like for you to like volunteer with fifth graders, right? And like, think, help them think through like telling stories, you know? Like that stuff is actually really important that I think we take for granted. And I know it would change the way you think about the world. Like that stuff, I think it doesn't have to be like grand museum. I think about me, this is my bias because I'm not a designer. I think about like museums as like the thing. Um, but everything doesn't have to be a museum, you know? Like how do we help people at the grassroots differently? Hi, um, my name is Ende. Uh, and also I live in Baltimore, so hey. Um, my question is about optimism and pessimism, so it's a little more existential. Um, so last couple of years, I've personally been finding it really hard um, to be optimistic, um, and I genuinely don't necessarily believe in a light at the end of the tunnel, um, but through organization work, I believe that we should work and help each other as much as possible until an unfortunate but inevitable end. Um, <laughs> but I believe that I would be more effective if I was optimistic. So I'm curious about what your advice would be as far as growing into optimism. Yeah, I think that's honest. Um, <laughs> I do. I think the light is there. Um, you know, the. I get the pessimism, like the pessimism makes sense to me. And, I, and I'm mindful when I say this sitting on a panel, is that like people don't want pep talks anymore, they want a plan, right? That like we've built a coalition as unlike any that we've ever seen before. And you're like, I believe in the end of mass incarceration. How do we end it? And like, you can't find, there's like no, there's not somewhere you can go, right? And I think that that is actually, that is where I root some of the pessimism in, that people are like spinning their wheels. It's like, how many protests can you go to, right? How many times can you call your senator? Like how many, like people, I think there's a fatigue that's coming that is like, the mask of it is pessimism, but it really is a fatigue because there's not a plan that people can wrap their heads around. And then there are all these people who are our leaders who like also aren't offering plans, right? That like, that it's a whole lot of pep talks and like how many more talks, you know, like, like I don't know how many more I can even sit on, let alone you have to go to them, right? So I think that that is where I root the pessimism from. I think that if there was a plan that people, either, even if it was one that people didn't like, but they fought about, I think that that would actually like do a lot of work. That's what Bernie did for people. Is Bernie sort of like skipped the how. You, do you remember when he was like, I'm gonna free everybody from prison and everybody's not even in federal prison? You know, it was like, he was like, I'm gonna free like 1.5 million people. And I was like, 1.5 million people actually aren't in federal prison. And then he just doubled back, but like he just skipped the how and like painted the world for you, of like what the world should look like. And people wanted that. And I think that Hillary, conversely, sort of only focused on that. She was, the how was sort of her bread and butter, right? So you couldn't see the world she was trying to build. She was taking you to do the like how you build it. And I think that people like don't want that anymore. People want a, like a plan and they want to know like what we can get. And I think in the absence of that, like the output is this pessimism. But I think that, you know, and there's the same writer who is, making pessimism cool again is um, <laughs> he, he has this quote about like it's an immature understanding of history to be hopeful right and I think that that is just like a really sad way to think about the world that like Harriet didn't do her work because she was like crazy right she did it because she had hope and believed that we could do something you think about all the odds against her and she did it anyway right and I think that we exist in that legacy of like I think we can do it in our lifetime I think that we built a coalition unlike any other I think that like there just needs to be a plan. And the reality is a lot of the research is done. Like there's not, we actually don't need to understand how bad it is anymore. We've done that research. We can figure that out. I'm more worried about the build part. That like I think that we can actually reasonably tear down all this stuff. I think if we don't figure out how to build people's capacity to lead once we start rebuilding, then like we could end up in a situation where we get rid of all the bad stuff and the only people have the skills to rebuild are the same people who built the bad world in the first place. And that is not a win. Like that's not it. Does that make sense? Let me let me ask you following up on that right. Do you think that do you think that you will see the light at the end of the tunnel in your lifetime? And is it for the big picture goal or is it for something that you think helps move us to to that big picture goal? Yeah, I don't know if it's a will. I think that I think it is I can. 
I think that like we, I, I think that we have an opportunity to do something bigger than has ever been done. That like our ability to organize, to talk to people, all that stuff is just like the tools are here in a way they've not been before. And the question is like, will we figure out how to use them in this moment or not? And I think that like that is a 50-50. That like I think that there is an opportunity for us to do it. I think that we might miss the opportunity. I think that we might get it. I think that people are trying to figure it out. It's one of my worries about like the nonprofit space is that. I see, I've seen a lot of people like who, who suddenly don't believe that they can win with the capital W, so they are like winning for themselves. And it's sad, because you see these people who like fought and fought, they were like ready, you know? And now you talk about like systemic change, and they're sort of like, well, you know, like I can't really, I don't think we can do that, but I can get a $100,000 grant. And you're just like, okay, this is like not, like we might have to sacrifice a little bit longer to get the glory at the end that, that like I think we can have. I also think about the absence of God in the movement is something that you can feel. That you think about with King and you think about the, the civil rights movement was born out of churches, like institutions, churches and schools. So what it meant to win was not rooted in this place. It was a salvific win. And like that is just gone in this moment. I think that that is also feeding some of the pessimism that people's idea of winning is a very earthly win. It's not like a soul win. Um, and I think that if we don't figure out a response to that, I think that that will be problematic soon. All right, so we're gonna do one more question. Hi, D-Ray. Um, Who's this person? Okay, oh. sorry. Hi, D-Ray. Um, my name is Jermaine, I'm from Baltimore. Hey. Mm -hmm. um, in day, my homegirl uh, actually just uh, kind of took my question. Um, so I'm in my feelings about that. Um, but I also, like Chloe, I wanted to make a statement, um, not really so much a question. Um, so I'm from Baltimore, as I said, um, and <laughs> You know, you said something earlier that resonated a lot with me um, about, you know, like the the uh, who's being held down the most uh, is always looked to as like the voice of reason. Um, I see that a lot in Baltimore, um, especially after 2015. Um, you know, I'm sure you know, like there's a lot of things that are said about you to your face, behind your back. Um, but I always, uh, I always say, I feel like I'm doing PR when you come up in conversation because, you know, I've met you several times and we always can have, uh, you know, a nice conversation. Um, so I'm proud of you um, because I think there's also like this, this, uh, this conference has also made me feel good in a way because, um, Everyone here, well, not everyone, but we've had conversations where we're talking about humans and not just design. Um, we're not talking about tracking and kerning, and me and my friend were literally talking about that on the ride up. So I'm getting off, I'm all over the place, but what I really want to say is uh, what brings me joy is just seeing you uh, walking in the steps of Bayard, walking in the steps of James, um, and I'm never going to say it to you without the mic <laughs> in real life, so I just wanted to say that, and um, thank you. I will say, um, thank you. One of the things, uh, you know, running for mayor was, I said I ran for mayor in Baltimore, and people were meaner to me when I ran for mayor than anything I've ever done in my entire life. People were, like, really crazy. And in Baltimore, it was this interesting thing of like, I've never seen you, right? Like that was sort of the critique. People were like, I've never seen you in the city, da 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 da. And all, and like, you know, because I was a candidate, I couldn't really like, it would have been poor taste to respond to everything. So I just had to like take it on the chin. But I met with people and it was just like, you know, I, I went, I went to Bowdoin in Maine, which was a great place. And then I taught in East New York, Brooklyn, came home, opened up an after school center. And then I trained a third, I trained and supported a third of all the new teachers in the city for two years. And then I was in human care and the school system. And it was this thing about, um, because we talk about proximity to trauma as like people's indicator of like whether you are a good X, Y, Z or not, there are people who A, like you were in high school when I was an organizer or like you were in elementary school when I was an organizer. So I didn't see you either, right? Which doesn't mean that you like weren't, you didn't care, but it was just like, literally, I didn't see you, like that just wasn't a thing. But it's this other thing too, where we, if we, if we, if we make primary people's proximity to trauma, what we actually do is we decentivize uh, people actually getting out of loops of trauma. That like, if you have kids and like your kids don't have any proximity to trauma, you've made this cycle where like, they actually can't be organized. Like they can't like, 
because having proximity to trauma is what makes you like a real person, when people like get out of that trauma loop, they actually can't do good, like that narrative means that they can't do work anymore. And that's like such a weird sort of problematic thing. And I think that Baltimore is a city where like that is, there are a lot of cities where I think that that's the case. There's another thing that happens across the country and I've seen it in other cities that I won't name because then it'd be a thing. So I probably should have just said it to myself, but it is, uh, they do that if you don't organize with me or like me, then you're not real either, right? That like if you care about you know bail and you don't sit at this table of the people who care about bail, then you aren't a real. And it's like, where did this weird ownership of the process and not the outcome is so so interesting, right? Like people are like hell bent on controlling who's at that table. And you know we got a lot of pushback for the Hillary and Bernie meetings because people were like they weren't invited. And the thing is, is that what's interesting is that people didn't want to meet with Bernie. And I remember I wouldn't let anybody come to the Hillary meeting who thought Bernie wasn't important because it was like either you meet with all all the presidential candidates or you don't meet with any but like what you won't do is just be at this like photo like you won't get to sit at the table and take a photo with hillary because you just think that's important and interesting and also this posturing of like revolutionary that we we met with president obama and i haven't written about this yet but i will at one point is that if it, some of you might remember that there was uh, somebody who got invited to the meeting who wrote this article that was like i'm not going to meet with the president because or i refuse to meet with the president because it's a photo op that is like the narrative that you probably heard. And what actually happened is that she accepted the invitation. She was on my prep call with the White House. She just didn't come. So an hour before the meeting, we, our phones start buzzing and like the Roosevelt room is actually pretty small. It's right across the Oval Office and there's like this box where you have to put your cell phones. So we're crossing the threshold to go sit in the room and literally everybody's phone blows up. We're like, what happened? And it's her article drops. It's like, she's not gonna, it's like she refused to meet at the White House and it's like, Remember, the White House would never release your name if you hadn't said you were coming, right? Like, they aren't stupid. They aren't just going to be like, hello, we're inviting these 15 people. Like, no, like, you said you were coming, and you didn't come. But what that allowed her to do afterwards was to, she became the revolutionary, and we became the solids at the table, right? And I'm interested, that was annoying, but I'm interested in, like, <laughs> in like what causes people to posture like that, right? That, like, you could just say, I'm not going to meet with him because I think the meeting's going to be worthless. That makes sense to me, right? And like the meeting went long and did it, like, you know, it was, a, it was a good meeting and, you know, we didn't agree with President Obama on everything, but like what, this posturing is so interesting to me. And I think about at home in Baltimore, there are people who like hate the nonprofit industrial complex but get funded by everybody, right? And then there are people who are like, you're not accountable to whatever. And you're like, who are you account? Like, what is, I'm accountable to the people, like, like, and I'm accountable to what I said I was gonna do. So I think about accountability as like, if I say I'm gonna do these things, do I do them or not? Like, you are getting tons of money and aren't telling anybody and it's like I get a lot of stuff for like m making millions off the movement and it's like the reality is is that we have only gotten $150,000 total in three years right that I made 165 as a TV human capital so we didn't ask for money as like a because we didn't think we needed to right they're like we'll figure out we did campaigns there with $15 and like a designer helped us do it you know like <laughs> That was dope. And like, I think about all these people who actually had made millions, who are the main people talking about accountability. And you're like, help people see where your money, you know, like, how do we have a more honest conversation in this space? I never realized that the organizing space would be so low trust as it is. Yeah. We have one more. Sorry, that was a long response. I'm sorry about that. Uh, hey, Duray, my name is Dejon, oh. and I'm coming from New Orleans. Uh, my question... Where are you, Dejon? Wait, wait, yeah. I'm up here at there the top. There you go. Oh. <laughs> oh right I'm right 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 I don't right see right him. Here. What's going on? Okay. Uh, my, my question comes around, uh, you know, right now there's a battle around Confederate, Confederate monuments and what we should do with those spaces. Have you ever con uh, considered what we should replace these things with or how we should even use those spaces? Black people. We should put black people on everything. I love it. We should put black people. It's funny because people people talk about the Confederate sort of the issue, like, are we wasting energy, right? And like I always think about I would never want a kid I love to go to a school named Donald Trump High School, right? So like we should name we should change all the names if anything might ever be Donald Trump High, like change it all. But what would it look like to put up like monuments to resistance? You know, that'd be beautiful to like have all these people like to honor slaves, like all that stuff I think would be incredible. It also makes you think about, I met with the, um, the Google Doodle team, like the designers who make the Google Doodles and they were an incredible bunch of people. Are you one of them? No. Oh, okay. I was like, oh, are you one of them? Okay. Uh, yeah. And what was incredible, what was interesting about that from an equity perspective is that they were talking about how one of the early rules of the doodle of the doodles was that they only celebrated people's birthday 
Like that was one of the rules. And what they realized is that that almost always meant that they were celebrating white people because slaves, they didn't know slaves' birthdays. They didn't know indigenous people's birthdays. Like they just didn't have their birthdays. And when the rule was birthdays only, like that was excluding so many people. And when they realized that they changed it and like that's why the doodles are much more inclusive today than they were before. And like that was interesting to me from like a design and sort of rule perspective with how it actually plays out in culture. But I think we should replace them with black people to your answer. Amen. So we're getting ready to wrap up. And I just want to finish with a question sort of going back to the theme um, around design resistance and building coalitions. Like thinking about this as the keynote around calling to action. We've got a room full of designers, black designers, who are really grappling with what does it mean to be black in design? How do you resist as a part of design? How do you create as a part of design in a way that doesn't reinforce and continue the systems of oppression? What would you put to them as things that you want to see coming out of this community? So start with the biggest question as like a, just a mindset thing. I think it'd be interesting, I think this too often, and I get it, it makes sense, I'm, I'm guilty of it too, is that we want to know that what we do is important the moment that we do it. And the reality is that sometimes you just need to put the things out there and the, and the crowd will come, like build it and they will come. And I think about, like I would love to go somewhere and look at designers' thoughts about all types of, like one place where I could go see people's like best way of like re-describing healthcare, like the meme about, like if there was like a place where people could just like be in proximity to it and not not need to know on the front end like what they want because so many of us like don't know what we want we just know like what we have doesn't work you know like I know this plan isn't it like can you help me think about something better like that's really all we know sometimes and because your mind is just wired differently to think about how you build things with your hands or like whatever your art is like that's just I think you take for granted how incredible that is sometimes and how that's just not so many people's bias towards the world. And like putting some of the stuff out there actually like helps us think about and imagine the world differently. And so many people are waiting for us to come ask you. And like, I don't even know what to ask. I just know like things aren't simple. They should be simple. Like we should have better neighborhoods. I don't know what they should look like, but they shouldn't look like that. Like that's what I know, right? Like those are my simple truths. People don't have to be poor like this, right? And like, we need you to help us like see it differently. And like, you can do that now. Like you already have permission to do that. And it'd be interesting for you to, uh, to do that in this space. All right, can we join me in thanking Duray? Thank you all. Um,